Good morning. I'm Shell Browder. I'm a blacksmith here at Historic Jamestown. And as of late, I've had to become a tailor armor involved in the reproduction of a jack of plates. In this video, you'll see the reconstruction of a replica of a jack of plates. It's a type of armor that was originally excavated and conserved here at Jamestown. Welcome to Dig Deeper. James Fort was, of course, the first successful English colony in North America. Archaeology has allowed us to see what the James Fort structure looked like, but artifacts and tools and firearms that were used here by the early settlers are also available to see. In a separate video, you've seen how a unique piece of armor called a jack of plates was excavated and conserved. To better understand how this armor was made, my boss, Willie Balderson, and I decided to recreate the jack of plates. The first step is to create the small iron plates that will be sewn into the cloth jacket. Those plates were cut out of old pieces of armor, and they tend to be about an inch and a quarter wide. So the first thing I'm going to do is set my dividers by the ruler to an inch and a quarter. And I'll mark out this piece, which we'll have to assume is already cut out of an old breastplate. They won't let us do that here. So I'll just follow this and scratch a line in it. And I can go from there to the bench shears and trim this right off. I could also use these to cut them to width, but I actually prefer to use a cold chisel. Both methods were certainly available in time. These bench shears could be very, very large and would have been a common part of an armorer shop. And so would cold chisels. So I'll just cut two of these and then we'll go through the process of punching and bobbing the corners. Whoa! So the corners are just bobbed off to make these things slightly octagonal. I don't want to cut all the way through because that will be unkind to my anvil and to the cold chisel. So we just need one hole in this, punched right in the center, as close as I can eyeball it anyway. So there's a hardened steel punch. Take the little chad off the back and flatten the burr that's raised. A very, very common method of making holes and it's actually very quick. If I'd had some, some uh, lard, I would have just greased that punch and it would have come right out. So we have a plate and the corners are going to be a little bit sharp. So it's wise to take a file and just clean those off a wee bit. As I said, that's a very time-consuming part of making these things. Fortunately, I have an entire bag of them over here we've already produced, so we don't have to do a whole lot more of that. So the next thing to do is to look at the garment itself. This is Bob. He was started out life as a t-shirt model, and now Bob is um, pretty close to the size of the guy that will be wearing this. So I've used him in working alone to 
help to fit the parts of this once popular garment in the 15th and 16th and early 17th centuries. This is the lining because I don't know how much bigger the outside has to be. So the first thing I did was make the lining and fit it to the man that needs to wear it. Having done that, the next step is to make the outer portion and then attach the pieces together. Garments were made differently in those days than they are now. So each one of these sections is made as a panel. And once all the panels are made up, including the lining, um, perhaps I should show you the collars because the collars are complete. So these are collars that have had all the plates sewn in. And once the plates are sewn into the outer portion, a lining is sewn into the inside. And that will be attached to the garment complete with a whip stitch. A very, very different way than modern garments are sewn. So the first thing that had to be done was to cut out all the pieces for the outer section, which consists of a, an outer part, which is a thinner hemp canvas. some wool batting, a piece of wool broadcloth, and a much heavier piece of hemp canvas. So the plates are sewn between all of these, these layers of fabric, and then the lining fabric will be sewn to this part on the inside. This will be one of the skirts. I've left some of the plates to sew into that, that um, skirt piece along the bottom, so you can see the process of putting these plates in. So you can see that this, the uh, stitching is a very regular hexagonal pattern. And it all shows on the outside. This is the part of the garment that you'll actually see. The needle is a heavy sailmaker's needle. And the twine that I'm using, or the yarn, is a very heavy hemp yarn. In the time period, it would have been a bowstring for a crossbow or a longbow. Uh, I don't know where we can find large quantities of that anymore, but this seems to work just as well. The process involves simply punching through where you've already gone through to the other side. And going back up through the middle of the new plate. There's one point at which you have to tie this off to, to the next piece. Back through the middle hole. back through a hole on the plate above it and in the corners. And back through the middle hole again. And then this has to go through the hole in the plate diagonally above it. back through the same center hole again, and then the center hole of the plate diagonal to it on the other side, which usually takes it through all that knotting of the pieces that have gone through there. Back down through the center hole again, and down to the diagonal corner of the plate on the other side. And then this needs to be knotted off on the center of that plate. So when I start on the next plate, I'll start from the inside of the hole. So that's one plate added. The next plate is the simply the same process. So this is a continual learning process, but on all of the old ones, every one of these intersections would have a little tuft of green silk thread, perhaps a little tiny pom-pom. As with every other part of this, I'm just learning how to do it. And I've found this part as frustrating as any other. First is the problem of making little tiny pom-poms. And the next problem seems to have been how to attach the little tiny pom-poms. I am becoming more convinced that it was a completely separate thread system, that they're not tied to the bowstring, the part that holds the plate on at all, but are almost a backup system. Because on some of the images of the old ones, you see the little pom-poms there with the thread behind it broken away and gone. And on some of them, you see the thread with no pom-poms or tufts, or whatever they are. So I had to learn how to make little tiny pom-poms. And this was a project that I just started yesterday. So two nails with no heads in the end of this old wooden handle. And I begin by 
wrapping the thread around here 75 times. I tried 100, but that seemed to be excessive. I hope somebody else was counting. I was not keeping after track. So how do we make a pom-pom out of these loops? Well, I've tried several different ways, but we have to tie them in the middle. Put the silk thread through here. And back through the middle. And as I'm working on this, it's very slow. And I think it's important to understand that I'm very slow. People who did this sort of work in the time period were paid on a piecework basis, not by the hour. And in order to make a living, you have to learn to work very, very quickly. I would have starved to death doing this, at least at my current work rate. Yeah. So this comes off by depressing the nails a little bit. And all these little angel wings are simply cut through. And then that gets pulled up into a little tuft, which is attached to these intersections with a separate piece of thread. So we'll use my friend Bob here to illustrate the rest of the process. We've done the collars and we've started on the skirts. We've seen how they're attached. The next piece that I'll do is the back. That's probably the single biggest piece that has to be done and will be the most time consuming, but it has no unusual details to it. Um, once that's done, then I'll do each one of the fronts and it has to have a closure. There are several different means of doing it, but I will probably sew in a series of iron eyes, iron circles to make eyes on both sides so that it can be laced together as many things were at the time. This is the process of learning to make this. I also hope that you get a chance to come by and see us working in the blacksmith shop to see ironwork being done, perhaps to see sewing being done in the archaeum or out in the blacksmith shop once the weather returns. And by all means, come into the archaeum as well because you can see some of the pieces on display here that were coming out of the ground. Thank you so much for joining us for this video of, of a learning experience and, and a sometimes frustrating and always rewarding journey.